Hey everyone, I'm Chris Lesniak. And I'm Rob Beyer. And this is the Debate Math Podcast. Debating mathy topics and mathy pedagogy with mathy people just like you. Let's get into this month's debate. The National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, or NCTM, is, according to their website, the world's largest mathematics education organization. The NCTM mission statement states that the organization advocates for high quality mathematics teaching and learning for each and every student. While many math teachers are members of this organization and may attend its national conference, others do not. Maybe you are someone who has wondered whether or not to join. And we wanted to explore this idea more in our latest debate resolution. Is NCTM membership worthwhile? Well, let's dig right in. So here, arguing that an NCTM membership is worthwhile, we have two awesome educators. First up is a former board member for NCTM from 2020 to 2023, co-author of Classroom Ready Rich Math Tasks, Engaging Students in Doing Math, Grades 2 and 3, an elementary instructional coach and part-time math education professor at Wayne State University. She also hosts the Kids Math Talk podcast dedicated to keeping the conversation about mathematics vibrant and positive. It's Desiree Harrison. Hi, Desiree. Hello. So happy to be here. Glad to have you here. And can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? All right. So I am in Michigan. So about I teach about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. And I am technically an elementary instructional coach. So that's all subject areas that I um, can focus on. I partner with teachers. Awesome. Welcome. And then arguing along with her is high school math teacher since 2005, the co-author of The Math Teacher's Toolbox and Practical Algebra, a Self-Teaching Guide. Also the 2022 winner of the Math for America Moeller Award for Professional Influence Education. He was a former chair of NCTM's Nominations and Elections Committee in 2022 and 23. He listens to a lot of audiobooks in his spare time and plans to write novels someday. It's Bobson Wong. Hi, Bobson. Hi, Chris. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. Oh, glad to have you here. Can you tell us where you are and what your current role is? Yes. Uh, I've been teaching uh, math at Bayside High School, which is a large public high school in Queens in New York City. I've been there since 2006. Um, I also work as an educational specialist for the New York State Education Department, which means I write and edit uh, questions for Algebra 2 for our Algebra 2 state exam. And um, I actually am currently on an NCTM committee that is working to form affinity groups within the organization. Oh, exciting. I think we'll hear more about that later. Um, and now the question we ask all of our guests is, when did math first become controversial to you? Desiree, I'm going to start with you. When did math first become controversial to you? All right. That's uh, such an interesting question. So the first thing that came to my mind was um, eighth grade and how I moved from just the, um, the regular math environment to uh, a quote unquote honors environment. And I was so excited and happy and I uh, started off the year. It was fabulous. And then I started floundering. And that floundering continued and my teacher, it, it seemed like my teacher started to withdraw from me and uh, my questions weren't being answered. I wasn't encouraged. And that kind of just um, put a bad taste in my mouth about math. Oh, no. Did you stay in honors after that? I stayed the entire year and failed the entire year. Oh, no. But, <laughs> yeah. But I'm here now, so <laughs> yeah, and teaching things that. changed. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And Bobson, when did math first become controversial to you? So it took me a long time to think of a good answer to this. And I think um, I, I thought back to freshman year in college. So I, I did very well in math in um, elementary, middle, and high school. You know, I took BC calculus. So freshman year in college, I walked into honors linear algebra, and I thought, you know, this is, this is cool. I can handle this. I mean, it's just, you know, just good. linear algebra, right? Professor walked in. Um, he, he walked up to the front of the room and there was one of those boards where you had like the whole wall of boards. So he would just, he walked in with a piece of chalk, no notes, and just started writing and just talking on the board in a very thick accent. Nobody understood what he was saying. 
Nobody was asking any questions. He would just talk and talk. And he was very enthusiastic. He was very, very, very knowledgeable. He would just talk and just write. And we would all be sitting there copying. And that was what every class was like. And then at the end of the class, it would be, okay, problem set due next week. And, and I had no idea what was going on. And every single math class that I took in college was like that. And what stuck in my mind was this idea that, that, that here are people who are very knowledgeable about math and, and very enthusiastic about math, but they were not reading the room. They did not pay any attention to what we were thinking, what we were feeling. There was no feedback whatsoever. It was just talk, copy. And, and that, really stuck it, that really stuck in my mind. And um, it really stuck in my mind when I became a teacher and I realized that there's a lot more to math than just knowing the content. Very good. Thank you. I, I, I think you're not alone in having the experience with uh, some professors in mathematics. Thank you both and welcome. Now arguing that NCTM membership is not worthwhile, we have two more awesome educators. First, we have a computer science and math teacher, an instructional math coach for grades 7 through 12, and an instructional technology coach for grades 7 and 8, who has been in education for 33 years, teaching and facilitating professional development. Former reviewer for mathematics teacher who served on the NCTM SIAM committee and co authored several articles for Mathematics Teacher. He is also the co author of Pre Calculus, Graphical, Numerical, and Algebraic AP Edition, 11th edition, and Advanced Quantitative Reasoning. It's Steve Phelps. Hi, Steve. Rob, Chris, thanks for having me. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? I can. I can do that. I am in Cincinnati, Ohio. I teach at, uh, in Marymount City Schools, which is just outside of Cincinnati. I'm a uh, computer science teacher and a math teacher, and I'm also an instructional coach, a math instructional coach, and a technology instructional coach. So I do both things throughout my day. Every day is different. I love it. Well, welcome. And arguing along with him is an author and a speaker, a math storyteller, a porous educator, who has presented at several annual and regional NCTM conferences and was a member of the planning committee for the annual conference in 2002 in Los Angeles. You may know him from his books, Pie of Life, Math Recess, or Chasing Rabbits. He's also a musical freak and geek, currently working on his latest book, Sonic Seducer. It's Sunil Singh. Hi, Sunil. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me back. Can you tell our listeners where you are and what your current role is? Sure. Uh, I'm just in uh, Pickering, Ontario, which is just uh, outside of Toronto, and uh, I am currently uh, sort of a freelance consultant uh, specializing in uh, humanizing mathematics through storytelling, culture sponsored mathematics, history, narrative, anti-racist edu math education, and uh, yeah, wrapping up my uh, music book right now. Um, we're really excited to be here and to discuss something very important uh, with uh, three other kindred spirits. Well, welcome back. Uh, now, the question we ask everybody, I'm going to start with you, Steve. When did math first become controversial to you? Uh, First controversial to me, I, I think it's been pretty recently. I think it's just like really in the last year and a half. I can't believe there's actually like a debate about this. I think kids need to know their math facts and they probably need to know those things by heart. I think that's been a controversial idea of the last uh, year, year and a half. So that is, uh, I would say within the last year, year and a half is when math has become controversial to me. But thank you. Sunil, when did math first uh, become controversial to you? And if you'd like to share a different one, from the previous episode, I don't know. Do I'll, I'll well. share the same one. It's it. My, I mean, I'll just expound on it a bit. I mean, my my uh, math became controversial to me as soon as I began began teaching, um, and I think a part of that was that, uh, you know, when I was a student and I did well, whatever well means, but I sat in the back of all my classes. Did I pay attention to all my math teachers? Sometimes, I mean, I just did the bare minimum to understand. But when I was put in a position of being a teacher, it just I was not in shock, but I realized how dreadfully boring a lot of this stuff was. And I was at the other end now. And here I had to put in my, in my own head, like putting pig on a lipstick, lipstick on a pig. And I go, I, get, I don't get to choose the topics. I have to choose. I, I, I forgot everything as a student. And now I was in position. And really, how was I going to navigate this through my career? And, you know, all the controversy in terms of, you know, subject material, content, pedagogy was installed right away, right in the beginning. All right. Well, welcome back and uh, welcome for the first time, Steve. 
Yes, welcome everyone. And with that, let's get into the debate. We begin with opening statements from each of our speakers. You each have two minutes to present your arguments. And we're starting with the side that is arguing that an NCTM membership is worthwhile. Desiree, you're up first, and your time begins now. So joining NCTM transformed my approach to teaching math and emphasized the pivotal role of the math community and building a sense of belonging and purpose. When I first started teaching third grade, I was amazed that they were naturally enthusiastic about math. I wanted to seize this enthusiasm to foster a sense of math agency, empowering students to own their learning and excel in problem solving. But I wasn't sure how. So first I sought out a math community within my school, but few colleagues shared my math passion or my, my passion for math pedagogy, leaving me feeling isolated. So I turned to the internet for the latest math teaching methods, but that often led to unreliable information that focused solely on answers. So that's when I joined the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. An NCTM membership isn't cheap, but sometimes free is more expensive when it comes to quality and reliability. The membership is worth the cost. NCTM offers research-based teaching routines, tasks, and toolkits with real-life examples of transformative teaching methods in action. The supportive community at NCTM conferences allows ideas to flow freely among like-minded educators and to push your thinking to learn from and support multiple viewpoints and perspectives. Armed with insights from NCTM, I started confidently implementing strategies in my classroom that augmented my teacher agency. I maintain my membership with NCTM as it offers a unique journey that enriches professional growth, it sharpens teaching strategies, and it can develop leadership through committee work and perhaps a role on the board of directors. In return for supporting NCTM's brave leadership through membership, I also learned how to advocate for math education on a local and national level. So in closing, an NCTM membership provides access to reliable teaching methods, a supportive network, and opportunities for professional growth that elevate teaching and inspire students to excel in math and in life. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. And now we will hear from the side arguing that NCTM membership is not worthwhile. So no, you are up. Your two minutes begins. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm going to go back to 1992. Um, that's when I graduated teacher's college. And I remember I came across my first mathematics teacher magazine. And uh, you have to remember, this is before the internet. This is really important too. So having a mathematics teacher magazine, and you know, at that time, even the calendar of the magazine was so robust, you could teach out of the calendar, you know, just the calendars of the mathematics teacher. Um, NCT was mythologized, and rightfully so. Um, it, it had such a stature in terms of doing a lot of things which Desiree already outlined. Um, now, fast forward 30 years, or more than 30 years up to the present, um, we're in the second generation of uh, the internet. Um, institutions, and this is a good thing, they, they shouldn't have the power they should because everything's been democratized and how information doesn't move vertically, it moves horizontally. And, you know, just going back to uh, content, that's what attracted me to NCTM in terms of having any membership was the focus on rich content. The landscape has changed in terms of technology, social media. It's also changed in terms of where I think NCTM is right now. It doesn't focus enough on mathematical content. And for me, it's more of the change in terms of where NCTM was once to where it is now, and the value that it once had, which was really, really high, is not as much. And I don't think they have done enough reflection to temper the enthusiasm about having a membership. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Bobson on the side sharing why an NCTM membership is worthwhile. Bobson, you have two minutes and your time begins now. Thank you. Um, when I think about NCTM, I, th I don't think so much about the journal. I don't think so much about classroom resources. At the end of the day, I really think more about community. And to me, NCTM has the most value moving forward as, some, as an organization that fosters community. Now, I mean, I got involved uh, with NCTM only fairly recently. I mean, up until maybe 2018, um, I was like many teachers, um, 
very distant from NCTM. I had, a, I mean, I kept my membership going, but I really had no interaction with the organization whatsoever. Um, and I was one of a group of teachers that, that started posing questions online about the value of NCTM. And I actually raised a lot of the questions that I'm sure Sunil and Steve will, will raise later on in this podcast. I questioned the value of the membership. I questioned the, the, the value of the conferences. I questioned the value of a lot of things. Um, I was grateful that Robert Berry, who was president of NCTM at the time, um, eventually invited me to serve on the nominations and elections committee. And that really changed my perspective on, on what the organization is doing and where the organization is moving. And I do believe that the that there is change coming in the organization because there is change in, in the field of math ed as that 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 Sunil um, noted earlier. Um, there are lots of changes going on that we can talk about later, and I think that NCTM is trying to adapt to that. And I think that focusing on the value of community and focusing on the idea of NCTM as a builder of community is going to be the future of NCTM and is something that will make membership worthwhile. Thank you, Bobson. And finally, arguing again that an NCTM membership is not worthwhile, we have Steve. Steve, your two minutes starts now. All right, thanks, Rob. Yeah, so I'm thinking back, and it was late 1980s is when I first joined NCTM. And this was more, um, it was instilled as a professional duty uh, by... Uh, my methods teacher, Janet Bobango, at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I, I, I got a great deal of value at that time. Uh, very early in my career, I taught a wide range of content classes, um, seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, middle school, um, into math counts. As Sunil said, you could use the, the calendar problems were super robust. And, and I just recall how mathy um, things from NCTM seemed to be. It was good. I think it like the, I still reference the 13th year book when I'm working with geometry teachers, the nature of proof and uh, Loomis's Pythagorean proposition. Those are just uh, old things that they were still kind of there um, in the late 1980s. But as I became more specialized in the things I taught, um, 10 years teaching geometry, 10 years teaching stats, 10 years teaching computer science, um, I found that I gained um, less from my membership because I felt that it wasn't addressing those specialized areas in a way that I needed them addressed. And I really felt more that the magazines and the things being promoted were just vehicles for college faculty to gain tenure. So um, I, NCTM did, um, did, did a lot. I, I got a lot of it when I was there early in my career, but as, as I went through and as I, as I grew older, I found other ways to um, create that community, for example, as Thompson mentioned, I found other ways to create that community of uh, the things that I was doing in my local area. Thank you all. Oh, we've got some good uh, thoughts to, to start us off here. So you've all been on some sort of committee, uh, conference committee or NCTM, you know, board role or something uh, at, at some point in your careers. So you all have a, a, a good like, inside knowledge of what's going on here. So I hear both sides talking about a sense of community. And I just, I really want to know more about that because I think to some people, and I'm going to ask Desiree and Bobson here, like some people, it feels like a closed community, like an exclusive, like a lot of the same people and the same voices uh, from the outside. And I feel like some people don't feel like excited to join. And I, I remember when I started teaching, NCTM was like the gold standard. I, I, you know, 20 years ago, I couldn't wait to be an NCTM member. Um, and it doesn't, necessarily feel that way to people right now like can you say more about like what the organization is working on to do that or or how to um help people get past that uh, that feeling um in terms of creating community i mean well first off let, let, let's start with the negatives i mean um yes i mean there, there's been there have been a lot of complaints about nctm over the years um you know um because you know, math ed has changed, right? I mean, I think Steve and, and Sunil re really hit the nail on the head. 20, 30 years ago, before the internet, um, teachers had, if teachers wanted to get ideas, where could they turn to besides the people in their building? Um, there was really nowhere else except for organizations like NCTM that would 
um, present these ideas from afar, right? And now with the internet, um, I mean, with, with the internet, it's so much easier to get information from all over the place. I think the 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 problem that I've found with the internet is that the the connections and the communities that are created on the internet are not sustainable. Um, a couple of years ago, there was um, TMC, right? Um, what did it stand for? Twitter Math Twitter, Camp, math originally, camp. right? And it was originally a essentially it was a teacher led, teacher driven math organiz math organization. They were holding conferences. It was a it was a thriving organization, kind of, but but it essentially collapsed, and it collapsed because people who were involved in it were not able to sustain um, for for various reasons. And I mean, what NC? I mean, you know, I don't know everything that NCTM is is uh, is doing to to make it more. Um, open, but I, I have noticed that, yeah, I mean, you, you talked about the, the issue with the conferences, that you see the same people presenting at conferences. Um, and this is something that I know the leadership has been um, talking about for a long time. You know, um, you know part of the problem is, is that teachers are not, you know, they're too busy to put forth pro proposals. Um, they're too busy to 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 get involved with that organization, um, and I do think that the the movement towards the creation of affinity groups is a way to address that. Because the bottom line is that we need to foster and we need to encourage teachers so that they can thrive in their profession. Because they're basically a lot of teachers are operating on their own, um, and they don't have anyone else to turn to. And all these, um, and so the creation of these affinity groups is going to be, I think, a way to begin the conversation to see, like, well, what do teachers actually need? Because these affinity groups are not going to be created top down. It's not like NCTM staff are going to say, we're going to have this, this group and this group and this group, and we're going to appoint these people in charge. It, it's really more of a bottom up approach where people will be invited to come to a meeting. And, and will be invited to talk, and NCTM people will be there to just listen and to see um, what these groups need. Can I just add on to that? that yes, I'm super excited about the um, affinity groups that are forming. So it's not just in terms of like new teacher or veteran teacher, but like math coaches or instructional coaches, or um, like in addition to like elementary or like rural, urban, suburban. So there are all these different um, avenues so that you can find uh, your particular niche of a community. And I'll also say that I am extremely introverted and um, I became a part of this wonderful NCTM community. And I will say like before I joined, I did feel like I'm going to be on the outside because that was like my internal dialogue and then um, I started, I just put myself out there and became vulnerable and just opened myself up to uh, Robert Berry and a few and a few others in leadership and complete, like com um, completely embracing. And um, so continuing to like make yourself vulnerable to get on the website and to sign up to um, to join a committee um, can just like be that like that push to help you understand that um, that internal dialogue that we have with ourselves isn't always true or isn't like isn't always reality and perception is um, not always uh, what what we what ends up being our reality. And let me take this idea to the other side now, like talking about community. So Sunil and Steve, as longtime members of math education community, are you making it worse by? You know, are you destroying the community by not being a part of it? Like, like you know, uh, government elections, like we should all participate for the good of the country. Like, should you not just be a part just to help it grow and become a good organization? Or like, are, are you the problem by pulling out? I think it's important to, I don't think we're going to forget that both Steve and I have rich and robust histories and positive relationships with NCTN. And I think the the delta of where it was once and where it is now, and I think it's really important to not to have blind spots. And to not be naive that every single institution 
on this planet is governed by politics and money. And if we don't address those blind spots, then we're going to have conversations which may not. Now, I think community is absolutely the, the core of it. But you don't get to grandfather community. You don't just to get to say NCTM is a great community. If its values no longer, it's I'm more aligned to values. And then where do those values come from? Oh, it's this organization. I don't start with the organization. You have to update your status. So for example, community, which I think is so important, and I agree with Bob's in terms of, yeah, social media, internet is kind of transient, although I've made so many great relationships. Um, I'll give you a perfect example of when community for NCTM, this is, this is recent in terms of when I felt that they, they let me down and probably let other people down in when they published their uh, position paper on culture response and mathematics. I thought this was, okay, wow, here's a chance to sort of reshuffle the deck. Let's sort of, you know, get back in the game because right now things are moving in a certain direction towards all the science of fill in the blank. Okay, culture response are really important. Um, I, I looked at it, I go, okay, did I miss something, Snail? And I actually had to do a copy paste, put the whole document, all the references, all the everything in a, a word search. And there was not one instance of the word history. If you are not going to attach the word history, which is the part of the opening statement of the book, uh, uh, Crest of Peacock, Non-European Roots of Mathematics, in which the first sentence of a 400-page book is an interest in history marks us for life. If you take that out of culture response, if that was a group effort, and there could have been like, oh, you're right, Sneel, okay. But there was no even like, like there was no correction made. Like it was almost like they conceded to the whole movement of this sort of codifying heavily mathematics and pedagogy and using words like executive function. What kid, especially minoritized kids who are going to receive coach responsive mathematics are excited about those words. So that was kind of like where I felt like I didn't belong to that community. And up until then, I was sort of on the fence, but you dropped the ball. Can I make a comment there? I mean, the the NCTM... Uh, was that the intersection of culture and mathematics? No, it was. It, it came out recently. It came out this year, and I think there was a follow-up webinar. Um, it was their position paper. I think that four pillars. One of them is that uh, mathematics is culture is not neutral. Oh, because I looked at the NCTM papers, and and you know, I mean, I remember there was something on. Um, they talk a lot about. Uh, ex creating a classroom culture that 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 responds to students' backgrounds, experiences, um, cultural perspectives, traditions, knowledge. I mean, history is a part of that, right? I mean, I mean, you, you cannot talk about traditions and, and knowledge and cultural perspectives without talking about history. I mean, in my classroom, when I talk about, when I introduce trigonometry, I take two minutes and I talk about the origin of the word sign. And I talk about how um, it, you know, how, how people in, in South Asia and the Middle East were doing it, you know, hundreds of years before it got translated into Latin. And, and whenever I mention this, the, the, the room just gets very, very quiet as the kids are just looking at me like, like they have no idea. And, and, I, and I try to, to, and I've tried to weave in these little bits of, of, of history and culture into my own teaching. Um, and, and I think that that's, I mean, I think that's consistent with not just what NCTM is talking about, but also, I mean, the the reality of math ed is that it, you know, the conversation has shifted, right? I mean, nowadays, um, at least in the United States, curriculum is is much more constrained. I mean, we don't have a lot of freedom to talk about, um, you know, we don't have a lot of freedom to 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 teach whatever we want to teach. We basically are given the list of standards to teach. Sometimes districts require specific curricula. And, and so, you know, I feel like NCTM is kind of responding to that in a sense by, by, shift, by, by shifting the focus more on pedagogy. And as, as not to say that they've completely abandoned content. I mean, nobody is saying, you know, to forget about content. Let's just focus on how we teach. But the reality is that you know, as teachers, we 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 need to do both, and and I think NCTM is addressing that. I'll just say that. Let Steve chime in. Um, history is, of course, implied 
in those words. Um, but it's a very powerful word because um, history, especially if you're very explicit about what history of mathematics means. Um, and so whether that was subconscious because of the times or whatever, and everything's moving towards pedagogy, or maybe, or, and look, I mean, I, we have to keep everything open that NCTM was trying to be somewhat quasi-fashionable and kind of stay in terms of this research, more research-heavy language so that, you know, it would kind of up what culture response of mathematics is. But if you're not going to be explicit about content, and if we don't have discussions about content, and if you have a large organization less like NCTM, the part of responsibility is to be controversial. We talked about what our, when math was first controversial to us. Well, I want an organization to be controversial. I want it to go, no, we're not going to go in this direction. We're going to go in the, we're going to still go in that direction because we have to because state standards, whatever, but come out and say something which aligns to your original beliefs. And you don't just, yes, yeah, sometimes you make adjustments, but really, if we go back to like, you know, the core of the mathematics teacher magazines, the core, which is the mathematics, right? If we're only talking about delivery and we don't even consider what's being delivered, then we're dropping the ball as a community. We have to have that lens open, the critique on that. And I'm looking for that also from NCTM to show leadership in that and not just go with the flow of what is kind of fashionable, but their own kind of institutional spin off. Yeah, I want to give Steve a chance to join in here and about the community or anything that was brought up. So, I, well, I, I'll, the thing that's most recent is Bobson mentioned about how we, we are very constrained. We have standards to teach too, and it's kind of ironic that NCPM published the first voluntary national standards in uh, is that eighty nine ninety. So, um, it's it's almost like are they trying to undo what they started back then? Anyway, and then the. Um, as far as finding community and the affinity groups, I've kind of like found my own ways to go at a much more cost effective rate. So, you know, I'll, 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 at the school I was at, we had to make a decision. We couldn't go to every single conference that went on, especially one that's as expensive and usually as out of the way as NCPM is. So teachers teaching with technology. Now, I know if I mentioned uh, Texas estimates, that's some, that some heads are going to blow up right there. But um, if I wrote a proposal that was accepted, they waived my registration fee. And usually they were somewhere, um, always somewhat centrally located, usually, where it was easy to get to, at least easy to get to for me. Um, but we also used math teacher circles as ways to create community. Um, we created the first uh, kind of GeoGebra user group here in, um, in Southwest Ohio. So we found other ways to kind of create community, but I guess it's just because I'm old. But uh, those are the two things that kind of stuck in the mind. The standards, NCTM started the standards movement and um, finding our own ways to create community. I'm not, and I'm still, I, I do have a question about the affinity groups. When, where did the affinity groups take place? Only are, are those things that occur like, do those occur at conferences? So the initial meeting is going to take place at the NCTM annual meeting in Chicago in the fall. And the idea is that it is a more of a brainstorming session for people to just gauge interest. Because, and there was a, and, you know, without getting into the details of planning, I mean, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, should we start online? Should we do it in person? And the thinking was start in person, recognizing that not everyone can go to the conference, not, not everyone will be there, but it's a starting point. And, it, and, and I feel like if you're going to start a conversation about community, it is easier to have that conversation in person than online, which is not to say that, you know, all the meetings will, there, will, will, will continue to be in person. Right. Because that's, it's, I mean, if you're, how do you have a meeting of elementary school teachers, you know, in the US and Canada in person? The idea is that um, probably there would be, they would, meetings would continue online, but it's really more of a, it, it, it's not like NCTM staff are going to be sitting there saying, I am the head of the rural teachers group and I will tell you what to say. It's more like, here's a table for rural teachers, come in feel free to sit here or feel free to sit at the high school teacher 
uh, table or feel free to sit at the Asian American uh, Pacific Islander table. Um, sit where you want to sit. Say what you want to say. Um, people will be, be there to listen and we'll see what happens. So, and I have to say, um, if, if someone had told me that an organization like NCTM was, was doing this like six years ago, even as recent as six years, I wouldn't have believed it because I did not see an organization like NCTM doing something like this. But I think it, it's a recognition of that there are a lot of people at the top who recognize that the organization needs to change. I mean, they know this. It's not like the people in, in, in the NCTM headquarters are sitting there thinking, you know, what, what can we do with all this money? Like, they recognize that there are problems. I will say that uh, the teachers teaching with technology, they've been doing affinity groups like this for probably about the last six years almost. Uh, so with, with this, um, this concept of, of affinity groups, uh, it kind of brings me back to, like, cost. Um, thinking about the, like, you know, our resolution was, is NCTM membership worthwhile? And we know that with the NCTM membership, uh, comes a lot of, uh, you know, like the resources and access online, but also it comes with a slightly lower cost to a conference. And Desiree, I want to, I want to bring you in, um, as you're thinking about these affinity groups, um, or just like conferences in general, uh, is it too expensive? It, like is something like this too expensive for for teachers, um, especially like newer teachers? Maybe if we think of teachers that are in their first five to seven years, you know, of, of teaching, is this something that is like outside of the realm of possibility? Um, and and to kind of tack onto that, thinking about the affinity groups and the first time that we're going to see affinity groups is in Chicago at an NCTM annual conference. I'm just curious if like is that the best option? Um, it, because of like financially, is it affordable? And Desiree, I want to bring it to you uh, first. Okay. Um, so uh, I will say that um, that idea of expense. So I think about um, like value and not just like how, how much if it costs like $300 for a registration, but like what value am I getting out of um, attending the conference? And um, yes, it is expensive. Conferences are expensive. And um, there are resources out there. I don't know that that would be available to every single teacher in every single district. But if that's something that you want to seek out, there are grant opportunities available through NCTM and other organizations that could help you get to that conference. And there are there there are other there are other opportunities. And yes, that takes a little bit. Um, uh, like forethought on your part, and possibly like writing writing something to submit, but um, there other, are other outlets if that isn't something that your district is going to support. Um, if, the, if that happens to be something that your district might be on the fence about, NCTM on their website ha always has like bullet points like to help you make your argument or make your case for attending a conference. And uh, you don't have to go the entire time. So I think some people forget that too, that there are different tiers. So if you're able to attend like one day or two days, and there are also um, other opportunities that didn't exist a few years ago even, but we do have a virtual conference. So there are other opportunities um, with webinars as well. So um, there are lots of different avenues that could make it uh, worth your expense. Well, and Desiree, I want to come back to you to follow up because um, I, in your intro, you talked about like not being a part of, of NCTM initially, and then like you got into it. Um, what are some of those benefits? Like if, if a teacher is going to spend money to go to NCTM, and when I think about cost, it's not just the 300 plus dollar uh, registration. It's the cost of flights to Chicago, the hotel and lodging for Chicago and all that stuff. Like, what are some of the other benefits? What is what's a benefit for a teacher to want to go to a conference like that? Um, I would say first and foremost, just the networking opportunities. So that many people have mentioned connected to community. So people that you've maybe only met in online spaces, you have the chance to have authentic, like you can go to like have breakfast with them, have lunch or dinner, or just like have uh, like go for a walk with them like in between conferences or in between sessions, or you can attend end a session with them you can um just having that like in-person opportunity 
to um, have some like back and forth conversation and Q and A with people is like in, invaluable. It's not something that you're going to get um, even in this space. Like this is a wonderful forum, but it's just not the same as in that um, actual conference environment. Um, and then, so there are um, like larger events, like the um, the opening session where you just hear from other people and just the the energy that's in the that's in these spaces you can't replicate even in the online experiences. So that's just something that once you once you go to that, um, that is invigorating and just like it, it makes it made me want to do more and made me want to to be uh, more of a more part of the organization. So and I'm going to go to the other side, Steve, to you. Um, you talked a little bit about like having your own affinity groups and been doing that for like six years. And like you talked about how you have more um, or that you found other avenues within like your local community and local district. So I'm wondering, like, outside of these, these networking events, like, how are you able to, to, uh, replicate networking and networking with, um, uh, nationally known people who are leaders in this field? Like, how are you able to replicate the energy that Desiree just talked about, um, in your own little area that you said is going to be, you know, at a, at a better cost? So I, I will start, I'll use the math teacher circles as an example. So we had, um, well, we started our first math teacher circle probably about 10 years ago. COVID kind of really got in the way. And that's also at the same time when I took another job at our county ESC, which also kind of interfered with it. But we're trying to get them started back up. These were, um, they started, sometimes they'd be about, we try to do about once every month, but usually they ended up being about once a quarter. We would meet on a Saturday um, at a local high school. And uh, there was no cost involved. Everyone would bring, you know, bring like a breakfast snack to share. And we would um, we would sit there and for maybe two and a half, three hours on a Saturday morning, um, engaging in really rich problem solving. Um, we would have uh, elementary school teachers uh, all the way through uh, college math professors. And if you were a visitor coming into the room, you wouldn't know which teacher was which. Um, and, and so that is one of the ways that we created uh, community in our local region, by local region, Northern Kentucky, Southeast Indiana, Southwest Ohio. Um, so the, the math teacher circles is, is one good way to do that. We did uh, GeoGebra as well. Um, GeoGebra was probably more of a, a, a Midwest region thing where I would literally, like if, you're, if you are a school in Ohio, I will, I, I will come to you and train you no cost or low cost, because, uh, you know, it, I, I will just come up there and do Joey with you. Same thing, I go out to Illinois and do the same thing for teachers out there. So th we, we find other ways and other vehicles to create community that, but I mean, I don't need to make money for it. I've got a day job, man. I don't need to make money. So th that is kind of one of the things I look at is how can I help other teachers do this without having to pay, pay things for it? Before anyone else comes in, I have a question, Bob said, and, and Desiree. So just talking about money and the cost of all this stuff, where does it all go? Like, I, I know there are, like, there are people who have full-time jobs at NCTM, but I, I don't think either one of you were paid or you were, you were voluntarily. So, I mean, is that fair? Like, where is all this money going? And, and it just seems like an exorbitant amount that you're getting if you have all these members spending hundreds of dollars every year. I mean, I, I'm not on the board, so I don't know... Um all of the details. I, I, I mean, I think you can look at the, uh, the form 990s for uh, NCTM and other nonprofit organizations, right? Because they're required to file those with um, the Internal Revenue Service. I mean, they, I, I think they, they, they have, what, like something like $8 million in revenue. Um, and they have like about $8 million in expenses. Um, the conferences do generate income. They do generate revenue. Um, membership dues generate revenue. Um, a lot uh, in terms of where it goes, it goes to running the conferences, goes to uh, running the organizations. Um, I mean, I don't know all of the details. Um, I, I guess that, you know, I guess this, this gets to a larger question, right? Which is, what should a national math ed teacher organization do? 
right? And we can say, well, conferences should be free to, to, for speakers, right? So if there are a thousand speakers charging $300 per person, that's $300,000. If we make it free, where does that $300,000 come from? Um, the executive director of NCTM gets paid about $250,000, which is a lot of money. But they also have $14 million in assets. Um, if you look at the executive directors of similar organizations, NSTA, um, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, NCTE, they all earn around $250,000, actually, between two hundred and dollars and $300,000. So, I mean, you know, and, and these questions of where should the money go? Um, I guess I'm thinking that, you know, I mean, these are quite, I mean, these are questions that we can certainly debate and we can certainly argue about. We can spend more money here, spend less money here. Um, and these are questions that I think, you know, these are questions for the leadership. So I just wanted to add that uh, just running anything costs money. So like just having a website costs money. Like having a staff costs money. So um, running a conference, renting out the space to hold a conference, like all of that. And even if it's a virtual conference, a virtual um, host costs money. So um, they're just, that's the, like living life costs money. So there is like nothing is free. And we could sit here and say like, oh, well, other, other, we can build other communities and not spend any money, but then you're spending your time. So um, there's, there's a cost no matter what route you go. Great. And Sunil, I know you've been dying to jump in, so go ahead. Yeah, um, I want to go back to Desiree's comment about energy because that was when I went to my first NCTM 2016 San Francisco. And I think there was like, could have been close to 10,000 people attended. We haven't talked about the dropping attendance figures. Um, the energy was amazing. I didn't even present. It was like, such an amazing experience. I mean, ShadowCon was in its sort of, you know, underground sort of peak. Um, and the exhibitors area, right, where you go to the exhibitors to re-energize. I mean, you're re-energized every, but top of energy, like that was the locus hub. Um, I was at NCTM Regional in Seattle 2024, February. And I'm going to uh, tether this with a uh, observation made 2023 uh, annual in Washington. I wasn't there, but a high-level executive uh, of a very, very large ed tech resource company was. He said the energy was dead in the exhibitors area. That's the same thing I found in 2024. That was the that was the beginning of red flags when we're not addressing things like teacher burnout, teacher exhaustion, teacher this. Uh, we're not discussing mental health issues with our students. And not just NCTM, but a lot of organizations just live in a bubble. And it, math education is a subset of education. It is not its own universe. And we try to do things sometimes without looking at the larger picture of education. And for me, the two things are mental uh, health, suicide prevention, young people, and teacher retention, especially among Gen Z, who are driven by mission. They don't care about money, but the mission to become a teacher is simply brown in this stuff, which doesn't have the gravitas of what equity was maybe five years ago and all that. And it's all geared towards proficiency, compliance, control, which it is, and language, which this is where you would need leadership to step up and say, yeah, we're not going to, I would, even if it starts to fail and crumble, at least I would respect in terms of they took a position um, that was the center of what, why we're all here. We're the center because of mathematics and we get to teach mathematics, debate mathematics, which is what organizations do. But, uh, 2017, the annual Washington uh, Australian woman named Bronwyn Welch came up to me at the end of the conference and said, Sunil, where's the math? That was seven years ago. And these are, these are not anecdotal observations. These are very important things that we're not talking about. And that's probably related to the, the siphoning of the energy. Um, and that's really what needs to also be addressed is, you know, uh, the attendance of these things, cost and energy. How do we get that energy back? And is NCTM uh, going to respond to that? Steve, did you have something to add? Uh, back with costs. So, um, thinking back to my uh, my two years on the NCTM SLAM committee, um, 
th- there was a lot of wasteful spending on that committee. That's all I will say. So I think there, there, there could be better money management, in my opinion. Um, they have been cutting back on a lot of expenses over the years. The NCTM executive director used to earn a lot more. Their expenses have been cutting. They have been cutting their expenses. And this is not just NCTM. A lot of the big organizations, national teacher organizations are going through similar issues because it's something that's, that's endemic to the entire field. And so I guess, you know, the question is, if you were NCTM president, what would you do? So very quickly, the first cutting cost I would do, because I was in the planning committee for 2022 in Los Angeles, we had a $45,000 budget for keynote speakers. Um, doing a keynote, this is where I'm saying it's related to, to do a keynote at an NCTM annual should be seen as a privilege. There's idea of servitude now. Anyone who's doing a keynote at a large conference like that doesn't need the money. You should be able to do it to cover travel expenses, a very humble honorarium. But I'm not interested in getting a speaker who demands 15000 I don't gonna care if they bring people in because they're going to probably mail it in. I'm not interested in those speakers. I'm interested in somebody who is a great speaker, um, maybe you know, is, is just getting to the roots of whatever the issues are, can resonate with the audience. Um, and we can cut costs there and make it things more equitable in terms of where that money saved can maybe go to. Like when I did a keynote in, a, it wasn't a big one in a, uh, Illinois, their annual one. It was a big, they paid me three thousand. Um, I said, don't give me three thousand, give me two thousand, and give one thousand dollars back to teachers in terms of you know teachers who if they can come to the conferences but they can't afford it to give back. It wasn't a lot, but doing things like that where anyone who feels that they're invited to speak should see that as its privilege on its own and that there's a way to make it things more equitable, especially in these times where we're financially strained, these institutions, and maybe they're financially strained. They can't think about those macro issues that I've discussed. So I would say, first things, let's start the, you know, not paying as much to our keynotes. It's still putting them in the position of the, it's an important thing, but I don't think we should be paying them nearly the amount that we do sometimes north of ten or $15,000. And can I get us away from the cost uh, arguments for a moment here? And uh, I think, Desiree, it was you who brought up the advocacy part of the organization. I did bring up the advocacy. Yes. And I did. I just want to like quickly respond to the energy about the conferences issue. And I specifically avoided speaking earlier about the um, the, the, the booth and like that that area because that overwhelms me and actually drains my energy. So. Um, I can't relate to that being like a drop in energy from there because it always dropped my energy. I was referring to the personal connections at, the, um, at a conference. Um, but speaking about the, so the advocacy, yes. So um, just NCTM just helped me to build my own platform and helped me to understand like um, different points that I want to bring up on a local and a national level. And they always have a legislative platform. So for 2024, they have a four point legislative platform. And um, our conference this past year was in DC and the time before it was in DC, um, they've taken a group of educators to the Hill to advocate on behalf of math education. And there's an entire adv- advocacy, advocacy toolkit that's on the website that you can access at any time. But um, this in-person experience, they um, they coordinated. So there were like each time there were like um, at least 40 educators that were going to the Hill to speak to their local uh, representatives on behalf of math education. And so that was just um, a really transformative experience. And it's not that NCTM isn't doing what it needs to do to advocate for math education. It's that um, sometimes... The people that are listening are like taking notes, but then I don't know where those notes go necessarily or or if they make it to the um, the representatives and, you know, representatives have other agendas and issues at hand. But um, there's always an advocacy mission that's in the strategic framework as well. So um, the uh, the executive, the executive director and deputy de- executive director are always advocating always going there. They sit on various boards to help advocate for math education. I'm curious. I don't know if either of you know, have, do you have any like uh, success stories of like how NCTM has moved the needle with any organization, like legislative or government organizations? 
I mean, I can't speak to a specific um, success story with organizations, but just what was mentioned earlier about the like, NCTM is the the largest teacher education, or math teacher education um, organization, and they influence policy. And so the all the different standards and iterations of standards, it's not, um, I don't see it as, a, as an undoing of what has been done. I see it as an enhancement and that there's not just one type of knowledge. It's not, teachers don't need just content knowledge. There are multiple types of knowledge that are, that are needed when you're inside the classroom. And one of those is pedagogical content knowledge, which the organization is moving towards. So it's not just content or pedagogy, it's content and pedagogy. And that is a specialized, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a specialized and nuanced. And, uh, and if we're going to move from revision toward true reform, then we as teachers have to take a critical look at how we are teaching and what our beliefs are. And uh, NCTM is influencing that. And that that's a crucial piece of policy. And then Sunil, Steve, to you, I, I'm yeah. just curious, think about as an advocate, like uh, as an advocacy organization, uh, as one of their roles, what if there was no NCTM? Like we all just stopped joining. What's going to fill the void? Like something that we don't like that no one on this call wants wants to, you know, be supporting. So like, like, what do we do if everyone just starts backing out? Well, again, I'll be devil's advocate here. I won't say this is in my position, but we're, why are we considering that an absence of an organization would be a negative? Um, because how do we know that NCTM is not causing hindrance or obstacles? And what I mean by that, I mean, we're all talking about advocacy groups, affinity, and we've, for the most part of the time, we've avoided the math content because the math content, you say the standards can't change and all that, that's a white content. Um, even the students of color who are very successful will probably think they're excelling at a white sport. They don't see their history or cultures in terms of embedded, like, is it still Pascal's triangle or is it like Pascal was the sixth person to discover that triangle? That's not just a minor thing. That's knowing that the history of something as beautiful as a patterning the triangle was there like a thousand years before even Pascal. It was there in uh, Italy, in Tartaglia, 100 years earlier. So the fact that we're not even, we're, we're kind of not, I would say deflecting, but saying that, okay, we're moving to pedagogy, but if we're not considering or at least taking a pause as to what are we teaching? What are we teaching? And, it, and to say that math is math is math is not true. I'm going back to my own controversial moment when I realized that everything I was going to teach was relatively going to be boring. Like, I'm talking about kids who sit in the back, who show up three or four or five days a week, or, you know, maybe skip. Are, are, is what NCTM doing, is it going to move the needle there? Are the conferences going to move the needle to those? Because those teachers can't afford to go to those conferences. Um, you know, the delta between who do these conferences membership help the most and, and versus who do they help the least, that's only widening. And I feel like we're getting away from the idea that we have to look at, you know, what are we teaching? Not just how and why, but what are we teaching? We just can't gloss over that because we, we've glossed over it for like generations. And we had a chance to bring it back part of the pandemic. But let's not, let's not, you know, neglect the idea that what's happening in America, it's happening in Canada too, is politics. Everything is shifting towards science of math, science of reading. DEI got hammered in Florida. We're not talking about that. NCTM should have taken a strong position about those kind of things. So that's what leadership means to me. And that's why I would pay for membership, which has leadership like that, because that's what you're paying for. And if failure to belong to something which resonates with your mission and values. Steve, do you have anything you want to add? I, I just think if NCTM wasn't around, um, I'm just not sure they have the same kind of policy impact as like uh, NEA or something like that. So I think more of a, a labor union that represents teachers that will probably have more uh, impact on policy than maybe NCTM might. I don't know, though. I need to think about that a little bit more. They, they, I think they, their goals are goals are probably slightly different. Well, that's a really good segue for uh, the last question that, that we have. Um, what does an ideal teacher organization look like? Um, you know, giving you a second as, as you're pondering that, but as you, as you think to respond, to try to wrap it up in like, if it was like an elevator pitch, 
uh, what does an ideal teacher organization look like? And I, I actually am going to start with Bobson and Desiree. So you, if either one of you two would like to hop in, like what would your elevator pitch be to like, hey, this is what the ideal teacher organization looks like? To me, the ideal national teacher organization would be an organization that supports communities of teachers. To me, NCTM should be the national community of teachers of mathematics, supporting state and local communities of teachers of math. Because the bottom line is, yes, some teachers are able to participate in local math circles or, or local communities, but so many math teachers are operating in isolation. They're operating under attack. And we need a national organization that brings teachers together for community, for, for local professional development run by teachers. This can be um, almost like a network of organizations that builds up leadership, that builds up those speakers that can speak at the national conferences and be those keynote speakers. Imagine if the keynote speakers were not these edu celebrities, but actual classroom teachers who started out speaking at a local conference, who then went up to speaking at a state conference and then got up to speaking at a regional or a national conference. NCTM has the framework to accomplish all of this already without having to build something from scratch. So to me, NCTM is in the, an organization like NCTM is in the best position to create this framework for community, which fosters all kinds of support and strengthening of teachers. Desiree? So, um, so an ideal teacher organization to me is one that develops community like with, um, with my fellow instructional coaches, but also just with the larger math education community. And I stress education because um, I, I love math education. I'm not necessarily uh, a lover of just pure mathematics. Um, and so building, building community in that sense and engaging in professional learning sustainable professional learning so that I can critically reflect on my identity and how my my past experiences might be a affecting my present and how I can um, stop that so that it doesn't continue to affect my present and my future so that I can help other students or help my students and help other teachers understand that they are capable even if they're even if they don't love math they're capable and they can embrace it instead of running away from it steve oh man okay here we go so i, I think it's a i, I mean the, the, the ideal kind of math teacher organization would be would be a, certainly local first off i think it's got to be a, a kind of a smaller almost one in every state maybe one in every corner of every state um and it, it's going to be like a meeting or a gathering. It's going to be community of like-minded individuals who maybe have some of the same, same challenges, um, same struggles, and are trying to find ways to work around those things. You know, like our, our local math teacher organization is kind of very close to that. Uh, the state teacher organization is uh, a little less close to that, but they're all kind of modeled after NCPM. Our county educational service center does have kind of teacher groups like that that meet monthly. So that's kind of getting at that um our math teacher circles or something like that so it's it's yeah it's, it's something that's got to be local and it's got to be accessible it's new i'm not sure if this is big as ideal teacher community i mean um you know one of the things that i think about in this profession and as you go up the ladder in terms of institutions you know teaching by profession is a conservative beast let's let's not be uh fools here um you know there's certain conservatism and the general tacit subconscious thing that teachers do, I mean, they're, they most come from middle class. And really the way that they teach math or whatever, that it's, it's geared towards success or external validation society, career and all that, it's really to become middle class like me. But you too can use math to become middle class. There's no internal vector for learning mathematics anymore. There's no celebration of joy, wonder, awe, curiosity. Those words have been shaded in obscurity. And even like if I just offer a simple question like this, you know, if you have one, two, and a three, just a two and a three, okay? And what's the largest number you can construct? No concatenation, taking 22 or 30, 32, just using a mathematical operation, you know, what's the largest number you can make? Now, it's not nine. It's not three to the exponent two. It's not nine. Now, 
what I love about this, so there's anxiety in terms of, well, what is it? But there's curiosity. Everything starts with curiosity. Everything starts with curiosity, not just in mathematics, but in everything. And we're getting further and further away from that. And that's why I think me, in terms of like having community, I'd love to be around a community that's sort of DIY, where it's like, you know, has a sort of like, there's too much expertise in method right now. I don't have time to go into this, but I wish it was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm just still learning. I'm just still learning. I didn't know that. And, you know, to have this sort of equitability in terms of, you know, we're all on the same page. There's not like this exorbitant amount of money being spent. Um, it's really cost effective. Um, but the, the, the raison d'etre to be here um, was the mathematics which excited us when we were kids. I mean, if, we, we're, if we're here because we did well in math and got high marks, I'm not sure if we're in here for the right reason. We got to go back to what made us curious about mathematics. I want an organization community which centers that idea. Okay, thank you. And that concludes our questioning round. We will now end by giving each side two minutes to make their final arguments to you. And we will begin first with Bobson and Desiree. Thank you. If you had $10 million to spend on math education, what would you do? If you were head of a national organization that supports math ed, what would you do? NCTM is an organization that does that. Nobody else is doing it. Twitter doesn't do that. Uh, local math circles don't do that. Even the, the local and state affiliates of NCTM only go so far. Only NCTM is the organization that can pull all of these people together. NCTM, at the end of the day, is a national community of math education. And there are a lot of things that are that are problematic with the organization, but it is at the end of the day, our organization. And at the end of the day, if we don't like what we see, it is up to us as math teachers, as math educators, to get involved with the organization, to join a committee, to speak out about the organization, to join a committee, to run for the board, to, to get that expertise with local or state affiliates, to help to change the organization, to make it more like the organization that we need it to be. It's, NCTM is not so much about the conferences. It's not so much about the journals. At the end of the day, it is about our community. Desiree? All right. So I just wanted to emphasize the local affiliates because I was mentioned earlier about like having spots in all different areas. There are. So um, that's how I started as well. And um, that thought about community or the thought about curiosity, um, that just really reminded me of the NCTM's Catalyzing Change series that really focuses on some key recommendations, one of those being to broaden the purposes of mathematics. So that is the direction. So we are actually in agreement in that curiosity needs to be brought back and NCTM is on a mission to have that be the case. Okay, and with the final word, we have Sunil and Steve. The floor is yours. You know, I'm a big proponent of Anthony, of the late Anthony Bourdain, and he said, almost all the answers lie to the messy middle. Messy middle. So there's a messy middle here, which I think consciously or subconsciously we've all veered towards, right? In terms of um, it, there are no sort of, it's not clear on our side, it's not super clear on the other side. Um, if I can make it really sort of up to date in terms of a very specific situation, uh, when I was on the committee for 2022, and, part, and, and Steve, we talked about this too when he was doing uh, the Indy Regional, same thing, same experience. And this is really important. Um, you know, I, I've reviewed over 100 polls. I think Steve reviewed over seven. I mean, I of the of the ones which, you know, I accepted, you know, I think there was a large number. I forget. It was over 100, I think, I, you know, for, for the annual. Of that, I think six or seven would I want to attend myself. I had to use the rubric and they all the all the buzzword language is used. And I start getting really tired and I was going, this is the creme de la creme applied. This is this is what it's all leading to. And in 2022, I'm not excited. I'm not excited because it's not, if this, would kids be excited about, you know, the kind of things we're discussing? So yes, uh, all the things Bobson said about, you know, organizations, community, we need that. And we, and NCTM for the longest time was that and still is to some degree. And, you know, uh, uh, Desiree gave me hope that they're going to reflect on curiosity. Um, but the reflections have to go deeper and they have to broaden outside of math and they have to include the state of education in the world, which includes, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, school refusal, which is uh, uh, 
problematic throughout the world. Not attending school. Like you cannot put what NCTM is going to do uh, without thinking about those considerations and mental health. So if those things are on the table, um, then I think there is definitely a chance for me to reconsider the idea of membership and if the leadership sort of, you know, echoes those things. So I, I think back, um, yeah, you know, NCTM, when I first joined it back in the late 1980s, that I, that's where I went to for my math six. And as I, again, as I got more specialized, I think they were less able to meet those needs. And so I found other places to turn to to get my math six. And um, that's just kind of how I've grown um, since I first joined NCTM 40 years ago. Is that 40 years ago? Oh my gosh. So anyway, that is, um, yeah, there, I, there, there was, at one time there was a place for it in my professional and personal life, but now I just go to other places and get my picks. Well, thank you all. And that concluded this debate. You've given us so much to think about, such great insights. I hope this gives teachers out there some good food for thought and some arguments to think about whether they want to join or not. And now it's up to our listeners to take a moment, honor the arguments, share with friends, and consider what's resonated with you. Be sure to go to our Twitter at DebateMathPod to share your thoughts on this debate. And huge thanks to all four of our guests. You were so thoughtful, respectful, came to agreement on many points. Um, you showed what good uh, adult disagreement discourse can look like. And as always, thanks to those who are listening. We hope you enjoyed and learned from this debate. All right. As we wrap up, Desiree, where can listeners find you? On all platforms, I'm at Kids Math Talk, K-I-D-S Math Talk. And Bobson? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on Blue Sky, on Instagram, um, at uh, Bobson Wong, B-O-B-S-O-N-W-O-N-G. I'm also online on my website at bobsonwong.com. And Steve, where can listeners find you? I am Math Tech Coach on all social media stuff. And so people can find me at my website, uh, www.mathsings.com, S-I-N-G-S, like as the word verb sings, not my name, S-I-N-G-H, sing. Um, also still hanging around uh, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, um, kind of, a, you know, as Nero is playing the fiddle as Twitter burns. Um, but I'm there and, uh, yeah, um, also on Facebook and Instagram as well. Okay. Thank you all. Want to learn more about incorporating debate activities into your math classroom? Go to lozniak.com slash podcast to sign up for my mailing list and get your first set of example debate activities you could use with your students today. Go to lesniak.com slash podcast. Don't forget to reach out to us with comments and questions on debatemath.com or follow us on Twitter at debatemathpod and follow along with hashtag debatemathpod. Rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this podcast. Your feedback is super important to us. Well, that's all from us. Looking forward to debating with you more next episode. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.